So I'm Ron Feldman. I'm the uh, chief operating officer here at the bank. That means I carry Neil's bags uh, whenever he goes. <laughs> Although now with the job I've had for six weeks, so I usually now delegate that to somebody else. So it's, it's, a, been, it's, it's a big promotion. So I, I really want to get right to the keynote speaker, which is Governor Brainerd, Lael Brainerd. Um, and uh, I've noticed most folks are not sort of going through the full bio, so I won't do that. Other, won't do that. Other than to say, if you have a small sense of inadequacy about yourself, you should read her bio, and it will be confirmed. And <laughs> indeed, it might it might grow a bit. So I I try to read it at least every couple weeks. Um, but I think the important part to know about Governor Brainerd is the insights that she's brought to the Federal Reserve System, both in the context of monetary policy, but in several other areas as well, including how we're thinking about fintech and how we're thinking about engaging with the community. So Governor Brainerd has oversight for our, um, our consumer areas, both community development and how we examine banks on the consumer side. And I think she's brought a tremendous sensibility about how we need to move forward and advance what we're doing. I think what we've, and I think this conference is part of that effort to be more engaged with communities, to think about these issues more seriously. And so with that, I will turn it over to Governor Brainerd. Well, thank you for that very kind introduction, uh, Ron. And I want to uh, thank Neil in particular for launching uh, the Opportunity and Inclusive Growth Institute and for inviting me to take uh, part in your deliberations today. Uh, I have no doubt this new institute will make an enormous contribution to our work at the Federal Reserve. While it's long been understood that opportunity is central to the strength of America's social fabric, I think we're increasingly understanding that opportunity and inclusion are also central to the strength of America's economy. I'm going to touch uh, this evening uh, on the key ways that opportunity and inclusion matter for policymaking at the Federal Reserve, ranging from our goal of maximum employment to our monitoring of financial health of households to our engagement in low and moderate income communities around the country focusing on how our work intersects with the groundbreaking work that you are doing. The original design of the Federal Reserve recognizes that the American economy is not monolithic. With our 12 Federal Reserve districts and their branches, we're present in communities all across America. This local presence by design gives us valuable perspectives on how Americans are experiencing the economy in their neighborhoods and critical insights about the very challenges that lie beneath the aggregate numbers. In turn, our local engagement helps members of these communities improve opportunity and inclusive growth. Inclusion uh, is an enduring goal of public policy that's embodied in our maximum employment mandate. The Employment Act of 1946, which I'm sure you all have memorized, charges the federal government with creating conditions under which there will be afforded useful employment for those able, willing, and seeking to work. And then in 1977, as, as you all I'm sure also know, that Congress amended the Federal Reserve Act to make achieving maximum employment an explicit objective of monetary policy along with stable prices. Maximum employment is inherently an inclusive goal. In fulfilling our dual mandate, the FOMC has set a target of 2% for inflation, but not a numerical target for employment. That's because we recognize maximum employment depends on the structure and dynamics of the labor market, which change in important ways over time. This recognition serves us well. It puts the onus on each of us as members of the FOMC to develop a nuanced understanding of the different margins of slack. This approach has allowed the FOMC to navigate the current recovery in a way that has likely brought more people back into productive employment than might have been the case with a fixed aggregate unemployment rate target based on pre-crisis norms, in effect achieving more inclusive growth. This is especially true at a time when the traditional Phillips curve relationship between unemployment and inflation appears to be extremely flat. When we disaggregate the aggregate labor market statistics, we often find significant and persistent racial disparities. 
For many decades, as you all know, the unemployment rate of African Americans has been nearly double the national unemployment rate with little indication in the research that the relative difference is narrowing or that it can be fully accounted for by educational or sectoral differences. The unemployment rate for Hispanics also has consistently been higher than the national unemployment rate. Similarly, during the Great Recession, the unemployment rates of both groups rose more sharply and rapidly than for workers as a whole. Even though the unemployment rates for these groups are now back around their pre-recession levels, they still exceed the national average. We also see persistent disparities by gender, such as the well-known wage premium earned by men relative to women. With your focus on inclusive growth, this institute could give us important insights on the drivers of those disparities in labor market outcomes, which can also help us better assess potential trade-offs in monetary policy. We often hear from community advocates who point to the stark discrepancy between the economy's overall U3 unemployment rate, which many forecasters are currently saying is at or approaching full employment and the much higher rates of unemployment they see around them. For instance, Rod Adams, a neighborhood advocate here in Minneapolis, noted the unemployment rate for African Americans in his area was still almost 9% late last summer and observed that, and these are his uh, words, if the labor market were truly healthy, people in my community would all be able to find full-time jobs at decent wages. While the policy tools that are available to us are not well suited to addressing the barriers that contribute to persistent disparities, understanding those barriers and efforts to address them is vital in assessing maximum employment as well as potential growth. Our community development work is invaluable in this regard. For instance, during the Great Recession, the sharp rise in unemployment in Atlanta highlighted the need for a better connected and stronger network of job training and placement services. I recently spent time with uh, the staff of the Atlanta Fed and their representatives, Dennis and Todd are here tonight, um, with workforce development organizations and communities, uh, community members in Atlanta who've been working together on the creation of the Metro Atlanta Exchange for Workforce Solutions, the region's only comprehensive directory for workforce development services. Just as there's a connection between maximum employment and inclusive growth, so too we see an important connection between potential output and opportunity. If there are large disparities in opportunity based on geography or race or gender, such that households' enterprise, exertion, and investments are not rewarded commensurately, then families and small businesses will invest less in the future and potential growth will fall short. Indeed, one worrisome trend is the decline in the labor force participation of prime age workers with less education. Understanding this growing detachment from work is important in improving both opportunity and potential growth. In visits to Detroit, Milwaukee, North St. Louis, and Baltimore, I've heard from residents and community organizations about the barriers standing between the many workers seeking jobs and the many jobs seeking workers. These can be as concrete as the physical isolation created by major traffic arteries or poorly designed transit systems. I visited Los Angeles with our San Francisco community development staff where businesses, transit authorities, and community groups are working together to support equitable transit-oriented development so that public transit systems are designed to enhance access to jobs for low and moderate income residents. Inclusion and opportunity also figure prominently in our work on financial resilience. While the resilience of the financial system has long been central to Federal Reserve policy, in recent years we've come to more fully appreciate that a resilient financial system rests on the foundations of financially resilient households and businesses. The ability to manage the ups and downs in family income and expenses without hardship and the ability to make sound investments for the future are both critical to household financial health. Yet we see from the latest edition of the Federal Reserve's uh, survey of household economic decision making, the SHED, which I think you heard about earlier today, that a strikingly high 40% of American households with high school degrees or less report they are struggling financially. And the U.S. Financial Diaries Project provides insights into the costly time and effort families with thin financial buffers must devote to managing their volatile cash flows. A seemingly modest mismatch between income and expenses can send the finances of some families into a downward spiral from which it can be expensive and difficult to recover. 
The recent shed shows that nearly one-fourth of all households are unable to pay their current month's bill in full. Nearly one-third would rely on borrowing or selling something to cover an unexpected $400 expense, and one in eight simply wouldn't be able to cover that kind of emergency expense by any means. Indeed, it's all too common for households to have inadequate short-term savings to cover emergencies. And we know from the survey of consumer finances that that observation does not just pertain to low and moderate income houses, but also to households in the middle quintile of income. Moreover, the financial crisis demonstrated that household financial imbalances can have important consequences for overall financial stability. The rapid and widespread rise in poorly unwritten underwritten mortgage debt prior to the Great Recession is widely viewed as a key contributor to the crisis. This suggests the potential value of better understanding the specific patterns in household finances that would give an early warning of a crisis. We're developing a more granular understanding in our work and look forward to contributions from the group here as well. Slower income growth as well as substantial volatility in income has raised the financial stress faced by low and moderate income families and may be limiting absolute mobility across generations. Uh, research in this room has contributed to the now well-known fact that over time the American dream that each generation can be expect to be better off than their parents' generation has gone from being near universal <laughs> to increasingly out of reach for most of the population. The ability to invest for the future has also become more challenging. Education and home ownership have long been key paths to opportunity, but the sharp declines in house prices in the Great Recession and the substantial rise in student loan debt have made it clear that investments in both home ownership and education are not without risk, and the payoff can vary greatly depending on the circumstances. Home ownership for many has been a way to turn regular expenses into an asset building investment in the future, which is especially important given the wide and persistent disparities in wealth by race and ethnicity. But the past decades suggest that owning a home can, in some circumstances, exacerbate financial difficulties for vulnerable families. The lesson that even a moderate decline in house prices can erase home equity applies broadly, along with the importance of sound underwriting and servicing. But the fact that African American and Hispanic households are more likely to lose their jobs in a recession and are also more likely to live in neighborhoods with concentrated job loss led to even larger house price declines and more foreclosures among these households. Indeed, there are many low-income neighborhoods in which homeowners remain underwater on their mortgages even today. Community development organizations are integrating this more nuanced view of asset building into practice. Better Family Life, a community group I visited in North St. Louis, provides would-be home buyers with education and counseling on how to manage the costs of home ownership and tools to navigate real estate markets and find good loans. This kind of housing counseling increases the likelihood that home ownership <coughs> will pay off for first-time home buyers in moderate to low-income neighborhoods. Similarly, under the right circumstances, education can be a critical investment in the future. We heard today how the earnings premium for those with a college degree relative to a high school education has risen substantially, making higher education even more valuable on average. Nonetheless, this outcome depends on the quality and type of education. The SHED finds that fewer than 40% of non-completers or graduates from for-profit institutions say their education was worth the cost compared with two-thirds of graduates from public or nonprofit institutions. The downsides from such low return education are compounded for those who take out student loans, in some cases leaving them worse off than before. Nearly three-fourths of recent borrowers, three-fourths, who attended for-profit schools fail to make progress on paying off their student loans in the first few years, and almost half were in default within five years. To advance opportunity, it's essential that first-time and non-traditional college students access smarter educational investments with more reliable and better returns. Finally, place matters. The connection between the conditions in a community and individual opportunity has been demonstrated in powerful research that many of you have pioneered, and we see this connection in our work every day. Families living in neighborhoods with high concentrations of poverty 
and low economic or demographic diversity are more likely to experience a range of negative outcomes, including exposure to crime and violence, physical and mental health challenges, and weak academic performance. Low-skilled workers who live far from potential employers or accessible transportation have more difficulty finding and keeping jobs. These effects of geography and opportunity can stretch from one generation to the next. Raj Chetty and his many collaborators have shown that upward mobility varies immensely across the country and even within a single zip code. This research underscores the urgency of understanding how we can make communities work better for all their members. With our presence in communities around the country and our efforts under the Community Reinvestment Act, the Federal Reserve can be a source of region-specific research and expertise as well as a trusted convener and catalyst on these challenges. One important area of focus has been housing, which connects families concretely to, to place and can be a source of strength or fragility. Last year, I met with Milwaukee community development groups and residents in one of the more racially segregated residential markets in the country. They highlighted the challenges facing the highly insecure rental population, which were brought alive by Matthew Desmond's careful research. Other communities across the nation face similar challenges. In the recently released shed, we found that among renters who had recently moved, 16% of Hispanics, 12% of African Americans, and 8% of whites had done so because of eviction or the threat of eviction. The barriers to safe and affordable housing often take on a different form in rural areas where ownership of manufactured housing is often coupled with insecure land ownership. The geographic footprint of our 12 districts gives us a valuable presence in rural America. Near El Paso, and I saw my friend from, yes, there you go. <laughs> you were there with me on these visits. Um, the geographic, oh, the, near El Paso, our team has developed important analysis of housing challenges in the Colonias neighborhoods where the lack of basic infrastructure and costly financing of warranty deeds pose special hurdles. We've seen successful models of providing affordable housing when community development financial institutions and organizations, banks, and local residents partner. On a recent visit that we took together in El Paso, I saw the value of these approaches as a single mother with significant health challenges received the keys to a new home in a stable community after many long years. While the densely wooded hills and hollers of eastern Kentucky are a sharp contrast to the desert and floodplain expanses of the Southwest, the keys to affordable housing in a healthy community can bring just as great an improvement in opportunity. As I witnessed, whether it be for a retiree in Helena, Arkansas, a single mom in El Paso, Texas, or a dad on disability in Emlyn, Kentucky, the keys to affordable housing in a stable community can unlock opportunity for future generations. Rural residents and small businesses also face increasing challenges as small community banks close and larger banks close branches in low population density areas. Consequently, as I learned from the mayors of Itabena and Moorhead, Mississippi, some rural residents, small businesses, and even municipalities have to drive long distances to reach a bank to safeguard their receipts. In the Mississippi Delta, community development financial institutions are acquiring bank branches uh, earmarked for closing in order to maintain that access for some rural communities. Although both pockets of opportunity and persistent poverty are found in large metro and rural areas alike, a greater share of the new jobs and business establishments have been in larger metro areas in the current recovery compared to previous recoveries. In countless communities, especially in rural towns and small to mid-sized cities, we've seen how a deep setback can leave a profound and long-lasting mark. This could be the legacy of concentrated reliance on an industry that experiences decline due to trade or technology, or the byproduct of poor connectivity, whether by highways or broadband. Technological change, globalization, and other shifts in demand and costs are not new to our economy, but they're troubling signs that less diversified and more isolated localities have a diminished ability to recover. Over the past 30 years, the convergence in income across regions of the country has slowed dramatically, and there's increasing evidence that such concentrated economic shocks can also lead to severe mar labor market stress, as well as harming health and mortality. 
Even so, some localities fare better than others in establishing new paths to opportunity and inclusive growth, and their successes provide some actionable lessons. The Boston Fed's Working Cities Challenge undertook an in-depth study of 25 medium-sized cities nationwide that had experienced a post-industrial decline and identified 10 that experienced an economic resurgence. The critical determinant of success was the ability of leaders in those cities to collaborate across sectors around a long-term vision for revitalization. To encourage such collaboration in other cities, the Boston Fed facilitated compet competitions that reward effective public-private collaboration in reaching community-wide goals. For example, Holyoke, Massachusetts provided a plan to simplify the city's permitting and licensing systems in order to raise the presence of Latino-owned businesses. On economic revitalization, as in other areas of community development, it turns out, effective solutions start with the community setting its own goals, are powered by broad cross-sectoral collaboration, and rely on evidence to drive results. I think we saw an example of that uh, with the great presentation from Sandra Samuels today at lunch. We all have our work cut out for us in helping to understand the state of opportunity and inclusion across our country and ensuring that policy is informed by those insights. At the Federal Reserve, we'll continue to navigate the recovery to ensure we reach and sustain our long-term goals of maximum employment and price stability. We will remain attentive to the financial health of vulnerable households, and we will remain committed to helping illuminate the specific challenges faced by low and moderate income communities in rural as well as metro areas and to supporting banks and other financial institutions as they partner in strengthening those communities. <coughs> in all of these efforts, we look forward to the cutting edge research and policy insights that uh, folks in this room will pr provide uh, to help us uh, in navigating policy. So I will now stop talking and uh, be uh, delighted to take questions or comments. Um, so. Uh, I was uh, curious about um, the fintech uh, issue, and so uh, certainly this has an opportunity, fintech has an opportunity to democratize how we think about financial services for low and moderate income populations. Certainly they've been um, with, uh, that's been an impediment toward accumulating wealth some with uh, income stripping or wealth stripping uh, with some uh, alternative financial services. So I'm curious about where you fall out with, is this, is FinTech an opportunity for LMI, or is this really kind of a threat for low and moderate income populations? So, you know, I think um, that with uh, so many uh, issues that we uh, work on, um, the possibilities created by FinTech, uh, particularly for low and moderate income uh, consumers, but also for small businesses, uh, they're both opportunities and risks. So um, we do also uh, do some surveying uh, in which we have discovered that uh, smartphone usage for financial services is um, extremely widespread uh, across different um, income and racial groups. So it's, it's not confined. Um, in fact, it's more uh, distinguished by uh, age uh, than any other single characteristic. Uh, which suggests that it could, in fact, uh, be uh, an enabler. Um, and we do know there are some really interesting models of uh, financial um, technology which uh, focus uh, not on credit, but actually on savings, which is a quite innovative approach relative to what we've seen over the last uh, many decades, and uh, using insights from behavioral economics to help people um, get into more of a default mode of saving, saving small amounts rather than taking credit or spending. But um, there are also a, a, a lot that we don't know about um, financial technology, and um, it is also, uh, can be used for predatory practices, just as uh, we've seen uh, in consumer finance through um, physical presence. Uh, and there's also um, some risks uh, to consumer data that um, are special to FinTech. And I, I think 
I've been trying to make sure that um, I'm as informed as I can be and that the system is as well. We have uh, a pretty uh, big working group that tries to bring in all different parts of the system to educate ourselves. Um, I don't think we are at a point where we think there's a policy response, but I do think it's incumbent on us to understand um, the risks and then to use the, the, the guidance, uh, the capacity, the authorities we have to make sure um, that institutions that are offering services uh, through these platforms uh, are actually uh, being held responsible for some of those risks. Hi, Bill Emmons from St. Louis. You said full employment is inherently inclusive. Are we there yet? <laughs> uh, that's a, that's a good question. So, um, so I have been um, looking at all of the margins of employment, as have um, other members of the FOMC, um, very closely. And uh, it is true that the U3 uh, number, uh, after holding steady for almost a year, um, started to decline much more rapidly recently. Um, it is also true uh, that some of the margins of slack uh, where we saw uh, a fairly large amount of slack have been narrowing uh, over the last uh, year or over uh, recent months. So uh, it took a while, for instance, for the long-term unemployed uh, numbers to come down. Those came down uh, a little bit sooner. The um, part-time, uh, those who are working part-time but would prefer full-time jobs, was about a percentage point above what it had been pre-crisis until very, very recently. But there, too, we've started to see that gap uh, closing uh, as well. Um, some of the folks uh, at uh, the board who have done research on labor force participation um, had actually expected to see labor force participation uh, essentially um, topping out a bit earlier in the recession. What we've seen instead is that uh, in recent months it's been holding steady, which uh, is, is a cyclical improvement given the underlying uh, demographic trend. The EPOP ratio for prime age uh, is still a bit low, um, and so there's a question uh, whether you might see uh, some slack there. But the reality is uh, labor market um, strength has outstripped what most of our researchers would suggest is the kind of steady state uh, level necessary uh, to absorb uh, new entrants into the, into the labor force. The flip side of the dual mandate is uh, we really aren't seeing much progress on core inflation. If anything, the last few months, um, we've seen a bit of a stalling out on core inflation. So that leaves a question. Is, uh, is, it, is there a nonlinearity in the Phillips curve? Is, uh, is the Phillips curve simply no longer operative? Or is there more slack there? And that is, for me, a, a question mark. I think other members of the FOMC have to answer that um, uh, in, you know, for themselves, but for me, I think there's still a, a question mark around, uh, are we there yet? You, <clears throat> you described in vivid and heart-rending detail, Vivichari, University of Minnesota. So you described in vivid and heart-rending detail the difficulties of some communities when their neighborhood bank closed down. As a quantitatively oriented economist, what fraction of those difficulties would you attribute to the Dodd-Frank Act and to the way that regulators, including the Federal Reserve, have implemented that act? So um, let me just say that I have looked at all kinds of measures of credit. Credit is flowing. Uh, and has been for some time in the recovery. Banks are lending, um, and uh, essentially we've seen um, a full recovery of the resilience of the financial system. Um, and, and we have seen so in a context where banks are much better capitalized than they were prior to the crisis, much better uh, able to absorb shocks, uh, managing risks much uh, more carefully, uh, and managing their liquidity for the first time in a way that uh, they can actually um, get their hands around. Um, those changes are uh, by far the largest, um, as they should be, for those institutions that are the most complex and interconnected and whose distress or failure 
uh, could really have systemic uh, impacts. Uh, for smaller institutions, um, for the most part, a lot of the regulations uh, are tailored. There are some um, which uh, I think we, uh, as policymakers at the board, uh, would like to see um, some more tailoring, um, and some of that uh, is statutory. So for instance, the Volcker Rule shouldn't apply to uh, most institutions below a very, very substantial um, scale. Um, similarly, stress testing is just not particularly useful to us and probably not to the managers of banks, many banks, that are in the 10 to $50 billion range. And so those are areas that I think um, could uh, meaningfully reduce the burden on smaller institutions um, with no impact, uh, no, um, no cost to the stability of the system. For the larger institutions, there are also some changes, I think, that could be made there. Um, the supplemental leverage ratio, for instance, um, is uh, the binding constraint in some cases uh, where that's actually probably not uh, the most effective way uh, to be addressing risk in the system. Um, but other uh, uh, kinds of changes, um, the stress tests, uh, the capital buffers, uh, the surcharge for the largest and most complex institutions, the uh, need to be transparent and stress liquidity, and very importantly, the living wills um, are enormously powerful tools, um, and I would be extremely loath um, to trade them off with, I think, uh, very little benefit um, to credit uh, or the vitality of the economy, but with potentially very severe uh, consequences for the probability of another uh, large uh, crisis down the road, which, as we all know, uh, disproportionately impacts the same communities uh, that we are focused on in this conference. It's on. Sorry. <clears throat> so, um, my question is over stress testing the consumers. And, you know, we got to highlight that, as you mentioned, if consumers had a $400 shock, which includes, from my perspective, not just, um, you know, I had a major plumbing thing to do, but I lost a paycheck. Because for many people, $400, that would be half their paycheck. And it showed, right, that most people would be, not most people, some 30% would be in trouble and paying their bills. So <clears throat> we've seen the subprime auto loans being very important for this recovery in the real economy because autos have been one of our better sectors. And we've now seen banks starting to tighten their credit. They're slowing those loans. Um, what happens if the Fed is getting it wrong and at slightly higher rates we dry up the auto market? The communities hit most by the subprime auto loans are black and Latino families who, as you mentioned, are going to be the first ones to lose their jobs. Their unemployment rate will spike quite rapidly, which means they won't be making those auto loans. Um, so have you thought about stress testing the consumer side? Incomes have not gone up. They haven't recovered to where they were at the peak, but we know debt has. So we're back to that same debt level. This time it's auto loans, which clearly will not collapse the financial sector. But in the real economy, that would be a huge impact if we dump a lot of recent new cars onto the auto market. We already have a problem in the ratio of used to new cars in the market as it is. Um, that would exacerbate it. So do you think about stress testing the consumer market, seeing how well consumers could withstand the shock and what that shock would mean in the real economy? And what do you think of the fragility when of the consumer side when incomes haven't recovered. So we still are in a debt-financed expansion, which means that 
slowing is not slowing of income growth so the people will save more because their income isn't back and their incomes aren't rising fast enough. Where do, where do you think about the implications of figuring out how do you manipulate slowing demand when it's not coming from rising income? So I think uh, those are a host of extremely complicated questions that I won't uh, begin to satisfy you on. Um, I will say um, that we do, I think, a better job um, of, uh, as we monitor uh, risk to the system, we're more systematic about it and we're more transparent about how we're doing that. Um, we've also tried um, to get a more granular view into the household sector so that uh, although I don't think uh, we are as confident that we know what early warning signs would look like in the household sector, um, we do uh, have uh, more granular data about household balance sheets and the kinds of loans that are most likely to get households into trouble. Um, it's far short of a stress test kind of a framework, um, but uh, we are actually trying to get uh, much more granular analysis of household balance sheet and particularly among the most vulnerable kinds of households. And that work, um, which is uh, early stages and would benefit tremendously from the work of some of the folks in this room, I think, over time, um, did, uh, did sort of have a flashing yellow on uh, subprime auto some time ago. And so we have been looking at that pretty uh, carefully and consistently over time. Um, and for uh, the reasons that you suggest, we are seeing um, underwriting standards there, because I think financial institutions are also starting to look at the delinquency rates um, and default rates and uh, tighten up a bit. But the underwriting standard there had gotten extremely lax um, and uh, you know, with loan terms that went beyond the life of the kind of average life of automobiles. I mean, a variety of um, developments there that to us signaled concerns. To this point, the concerns have really focused on those vulnerable consumer segments rather than a sort of broader financial stability concerns for a host of reasons that, you know, you, know, you do the compare and contrast between house, uh, housing subprime and, and auto subprime. There's very different uh, place in the economy. But in any case, I, you know, I think we're trying to be attentive to it, um, but uh, we're pretty, uh, you know, we're pretty humble about, you know, how uh, sort of um, complete our analysis uh, uh, is at this, at this stage. Uh, thanks, uh, Leo. You know, this discussion of credit and availability of credit, there's something that's been, I've been wrestling with and I don't have a good answer, so I'm going to try you, see if you've thought about this or have perspective on it. We saw today that the average credit score for a new mortgage borrower is something like 760 today, which was shocking to me because a year and a half ago I got a mortgage with my wife, excruciatingly painful process. Uh, which I've written about publicly. My credit score is around 760. Like my only debt that I have is my mortgage. I pay all my credit cards every month. I paid off my student loan several years ago. My, my credit history is perfect, right? I pay everything off perfectly. And if I'm the average borrower, <laughs> I, w what, I, what I find striking by this is <laughs> the, biggest, right, the biggest banks are, are, are buying back their stock. So they're choosing not to make loans to people who have slightly worse credit than me, than perfect credit, effectively, somebody who pays off all their bills, and they're choosing to buy back their stock. I'm just trying to think about, we certainly don't want to force banks to make loans they're not comfortable with, but at the same time, the choices they're making about only lending to people like me, I find that troubling. I thought you were going to uh, tell us why you're a, a big risk. <laughs> and why we should be looking at the system. <laughs> <laughs> no, so I think, um, I, you know, I think we've all been tracking um, the housing market uh, very closely for, you know, all the obvious reasons because it is an asset building uh, path that has been uh, really very successful in previous history because it's so important to the strength of demand in the U.S. economy. Um, and uh, it's absolutely uh, true uh, that the minimum FICO score 
uh, that uh, uh, people are able to access uh, mortgages while well below yours is still well above pre-crisis norms. Um, and uh, that um, a, lot of the, uh, a lot of the concerns that uh, banks articulate uh, have to do with put-back risk uh, at uh, FHA, which still hasn't been completely satisfied, um, at least in their views. Um, the result of which is that we're seeing a lot of that financing, even more of that financing moving outside uh, of the banking system. And uh, people who previously would have been able to get mortgages no longer able to. The other factor that seems to be um, relevant, although here I think the research is, is uh, indicative but maybe not entirely conclusive, is that first time home buyers uh, are coming to the market later. Um, and uh, the household formation uh, rate is only now beginning to look a bit uh, like it did pre-crisis, in part because uh, in part because of changes in risk perceptions, no doubt, but in part because they are coming with heavier burdens from student loans, uh, and so that seems also mm -hmm. to be delaying both household formation uh, and home ownership in a way that seems to be material. So those are all concerns. Um, does that mean we should tip in the other balance, um, you know, and sort of let people get um, loans that are poorly structured um, and, you know, have a pretty high risk that they will not be uh, manageable uh, when interest rates change, for instance? No. Um, so I, I don't have a very, you know, satisfying um, response to that conundrum. Lael, if, if Neil can ask that question, then I have one for you as well. <laughs> I'm just uh, wondering if we're going to hear about your auto loans. <laughs> <laughs> and this is a longer, a longer term question. It's the, the, the basic question is, how do you think about it? Whether do you worry or do you not? Artificial intelligence, robotics, automation, autonomous vehicles. Um, service jobs including financial analysts being replaced by machine learning threat or opportunity is it something you worry about in terms of dis uh, disruption to employment in the country or not so um, I, you know when I um, look at some of the developments it's you know it's very hard to peer around the corner as I'm sure um, you you also um, have found um, but some of the areas that automation is uh, quickly making inroads are um, uh, occupations that were uh, like some of the uh, manufacturing jobs uh, that were impacted by trade, for instance, are on ramps um, to the middle class or at least on ramps to productive employment and stable employment. Um, so Automation uh, is going to accelerate in fast food, for instance. Um, uh, driving, um, uh, driving of all types. Uh, th those are also occupations that were uh, stable and remunerative uh, for people without, uh, uh, without college degrees, with high school degrees. So I, I worry that um, that same segment of the population um, could uh, find uh, that it's very difficult um, to adapt um, as some of these developments uh, proceed. Now, of course, you're right that they could also um, impact uh, professional and managerial kinds of, uh, and I'm sure they will, but I think I worry more about people for whom these jobs are really the most uh, stable and viable path to um, Income security and um, to uh, establishing a better life for their for their children. On the other hand, we've seen um, the economy adapt uh, continuously uh, and create new jobs in different sectors. And you know, I, I have no doubt um, that a similar kind of process is underway uh, now. Again, you know, in our um, in our set of institutions and political culture. You know, we don't do, we do a terrible job of taking care of those um, who lose out in those processes. And so the kinds of um, income uh, graphs that we were looking at today, the same kinds of uh, trends could be even further exacerbated by these kinds of developments unless we find better ways 
of helping those who are losing out, I think I, that troubles me. Roy Lopez from uh, Dallas, Texas. Uh, Governor Brainer, I'm going to try to be bipartisan here. But uh, the, the Trump administration has proposed zeroing out the CDFI fund. There's been severe cutbacks, proposed cutbacks, with large uh, block grant programs. Uh, the CFPB is, may not exist in its current form. Uh, so my question is, where is the hope for LMI? clients, where is the hope for LMI families in, in a new administration? Is it with a revamped tax system? Is it with a more emphasis on small businesses? The, the, the pendulum is swinging back. Where do you see LMI families in one or two years from today? Mm -hmm. So um, I'm going to choose not to answer exactly that question. <laughs> Uh, because, uh, because as you know, um, you know we uh, we are very independent. Um, however, um, it is true that when I travel around the country with you and with others, um, and we meet with um, community development organizations, uh, they specialize in being very entrepreneurial at mixing and matching the kinds of programs um, that are available at the federal level, at the state level. Um, and they need all of those programs to make some of these paths to opportunity work. So when you, you know, are there for um, a single mother receiving the keys to a new home, that was a patchwork of uh, subsidies, you know, whether it be from USDA, from HUD, from CDFI, plus some, you know, state level subsidies, plus uh, some local businesses and philanthropies, plus businesses that, uh, and financial institutions maybe that are getting credit under CRA. So, you know, we do have a um, sector of entrepreneurs who are great at putting uh, these things together and helping to underwrite um, very meaningful investments in communities and creating opportunities. And I do uh, worry um, that, uh, you know, it's very costly uh, to start from scratch again and to try to come up with a new business model. And these business models, they are working. They're working at the micro level, but we can see, uh, as we saw today at lunch uh, with Sandra, that these entrepreneurs are putting together meaningful programs that are helping communities uh, come together and invest in their own future. So I, you know, I, I just hope that there's still uh, some uh, you know, sort of um, ability to put various programs together uh, and build those kinds of platforms. Governor Brainerd, uh, John Moon with the Federal Reserve, thank you so much for taking this time to spend with us. Um, so going back to the, a future question, um, so in 30 to 40 years, the United States is going to be a majority minority country. And um, with uh, many of the issues that we talked about today, um, uh, the significant disparities, uh, particularly within Latino and African American communities where especially entitlement programs are based on a productive workforce. How, how might we think about that in the future? I, you know, in, in San Francisco, where we already are, in California is a majority minority. We as an organization, the bank has you know, really doubled down on our focus on diversity and inclusion, knowing that we need to better understand our, our, um, uh, the people in our state and, and for in our district as a whole. But how, how should we be thinking about it as a system and, and as the board? So um, uh, it, it is a priority um, at the system-wide level. It's something that we've engaged um, uh, with uh, each other at the board and also with all of the uh, reserve banks on. And I, I know I can speak for all of the presidents, past and present, that this is something that we've all been uh, increasing our efforts on. Um, so a few things, um, uh, you know, the, 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 the for us, obviously, we don't run programs, um, um, but we do need to understand uh, what's uh, happening uh, in local communities and where there are those kinds of disparities for the reasons that I said earlier. Because they actually matter um, to maximum employment, they actually are critically important for uh, potential growth. 
uh, and for using um, our labor force in the most productive way possible and making sure that we have as expansive a labor force as we can uh, given uh, demographic trends. Um, and so part of what we've been doing um, is just being more explicit in our um, public research and analysis that these things matter. So um, David and Stephanie have been very engaged on uh, these efforts and you can see it in the monetary policy report where we're trying to be much more granular about racial disparities um, in employment uh, and labor force participation and some of the factors that do explain those uh, and some of the, um, the remaining um, uh, discrepancies that simply cannot be explained uh, well uh, by observable um, uh, characteristics. We also are trying to um, uh, improve uh, our own diversity uh, and our own inclusion. Um, and we've got a really um, big challenge ahead of us. Uh, we're making progress. It's a very um, uh, top priority in all of the districts and certainly at the board, um, but it's a slow uh, process. Um, and in part, it's because we need to get um, better representation of African Americans and Hispanics in some of the professional arenas. So we've been working with Lisa and with others uh, for instance, in the uh, economics uh, recruiting uh, arena to convince people this is, this is a great uh, profession uh, and, you know, spend some time with us, you'll love it. Um, but um, but it's, a, it's a, uh, something that I think um, we try to do better on in, our, um, uh, in, in the um, councils, um, in the boards of directors, um, so you'll see if you look at the class A and class B directors, those statistics are getting better and we are seeing the benefit of it in terms of the quality of interaction that we have, um, that greater diversity of the folks around the table at each of the reserve banks and in our councils um, is really helping us uh, do a better job. So that, that too uh, is an area of uh, continued improvement and then of course community development is the area where I think we can engage uh, most deeply on some of these issues. But it's, um, you know, we're falling short um, and we care a lot about it. It's a very high priority, but it's, it's gonna, it's a long-term investment plan. It's gonna take us a while to get there. All right, is that it? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs>